Okay, I've, I've had this crazy little uh, rant in my hip pocket for the last few years that I've been thinking about a lot. And I think it's important as far as how stories and games interact. And that's been a big portion of my career. I, I like to talk about, um, I, I started out in game design. I moved my way into writing novels. I write all sorts of other stuff. But the key thing for me, the crux of my career is really the intersection of stories and games. And so um, I think about this kind of stuff a lot. And I think the main thing that people forget about, uh, about games is that, or why we want to combine stories and games, is because the stories give the games a context, right? And if the games have a context, then that gives them meaning. And the meaning gives, uh, gives you a reason to keep playing these games, a reason to keep exploring within these games, more than just playing around with a toy with. And I like to think about things like, uh, you know, the first first person shooter came out, right? Uh, like Quake or Doom or whatever. And these were just basically running around and shooting things in 3D environments. And that's really fun for a while. And a lot of times they didn't have any plot or anything. You're just competing against other people. But uh, after a while, that gets dull, right? You, there's no context there. There's nothing to give you any kind of a framework for that to mean anything. But same thing goes with the games like Tetris or even going back to Tic-Tac-Toe. After a while, without any kind of context, it's just random running around and doing silly shit and it gets boring after a while however if you can wrap that same mechanic whatever it happens to be that same basic kind of game in a brand new story of some sort then suddenly that becomes more meaningful and that's the difference between say again playing unreal tournament or unreal when it first came out and you're just running around shooting stuff and playing bioshock infinite which has got a, a large story that uh, draws you in and takes you on for chapter after chapter or you know Eventually, if you're doing even third-person shooters, you know, like Uncharted 4, which I think was really uh, an amazing masterpiece of storytelling in games, actually. It brings you through the story in a lot of ways and makes the game seem much more exciting than a bunch of jumping puzzles would otherwise, right? Why would you care about jumping puzzles after a while? What's the point of solving the puzzles? The point of solving the puzzles is because they're welded intricately into the nature and the the uh, the topic of the game right and the, and the story so if the story makes you feel like you're playing a game that uh that dovetails in with it nicely then that's something that'll bring you coming you know, come bring you back again and again and again and again um this is one of the ways we get people to finish games for instance a lot of times when we're designing games and we uh we have metrics on this kind of stuff so we can tell most people never finish the games that they start you know whether they have great narratives or not um, but if they have fantastic narratives, that's what drags you through the, the grinding parts of the game that maybe aren't as exciting for you or maybe you've gotten bored with. Uh, if you realize that, you know, it's not just about whether or not I can solve this puzzle or get the ball in the hoop over there or ram it with this car over here, but what does that mean in terms of the overall story? That's what brings you along. So it's not even so much, you know, they often would say content is king, right? And all sorts of different things on either the web or in video games or whatever. In, I think it's better to say context is king because the story, if it does it properly, is giving you the context in which you care about the activity that you're taking part in. And if the activity doesn't have any context, then it's just random running around. I mean, what is even a soccer game if you're just kicking a ball, right? It, it, it actually have a reason. You have to have a kick and throw a goal and you have to have defenders and you actually come up with all this stuff. And after a while, actually, honestly, just playing soccer, if you don't care about the players, and if you don't care about who you're competing against, starts to take on no meaning at all. It gets boring again. It's just practice, right? Practice is great in and of itself. It gets you exercise, but nobody cares about practice. They care about beating the crosstown rival, right? They care about fighting for the championship. Those are stories that we as consumers, as fans, as commentators, we build up around things like sports, much less any kind of a video game or a tabletop game or anything else. And it's because of those bits there that we actually get people who get really excited about this. Fights break out over this kind of stuff. People get shot and killed over this kind of stuff. People are drunken idiots over this kind of stuff because they care about it, right? It's actually something that will break your heart. If you saw the Cubs win their World Series for the first time in 100, over 100 years last year, that was an amazing moment. But it wasn't an amazing moment because one team beat another moment. It was an amazing moment because these incredible, we as as fans will bring up around this stuff. The interesting thing about this is it actually can come back to video games that way, not just in the sense that we're developing games and telling stories in the games, but also in uh, in esports, right? If you got people are competing in the Halo World Championship, again, why do you care about some idiots you've never heard about playing Halo? It's just a bunch of people, you know, banging on each other in the middle of a video game. 
But if you know that these are two rival teams that have been working so hard and practicing night and day, and you get to know the different players and the different kinds of styles and the costumes that they wear and the different mods that they have on their, on their outfits, whatever, suddenly that means a lot more to you, right? And that's one of the reasons in countries like Korea, South Korea, they have people who are making millions of dollars on endorsement deals just playing video games, right? Because, again, people care about that because of the context that's been put up around it. It's, uh, you know, it's one of the things that takes, for instance, a first-person game and transforms it into a puzzle game. You can cross things that way, like Portal does, for instance. Portal is a fantastic example of uh, somebody taking a, a tired mechanic at that point, which is basically first-person shooters, and melding that into another kind of game and then melding another fantastic story on top of it. So it's not just about solving first-person shooter puzzles, but having this incredible villain that you're learning about and having it unfold as you play the game. And it's a great example, again, of context, because it's not just about the dialogue that you have with the evil computer that's putting you through the test portal. It's about the environment that you're in. So it's not just the dialogue, but, you know, you get to see things that are written in graffiti on the walls that say the cake is a lie, right? And that's not about uh, a story that you're being told so much as you're experiencing in a way that you could not in just about any other medium right? And I think it's important that uh, games are developing their own kinds of ways to tell stories, where you might have missed that. It might not mean anything to your own personal story, but if you stop, pay attention, see what people are building around you, if you even the colors that are being used, the way that the shots are being framed, informs the context of it. Uh, I was talking about this earlier, where, you know, even the way you frame a photograph gives you context for something, and the same thing happens in games. I mean, if you don't have a frame for a photograph, you're just looking around at everything, and if you've ever screwed around with 360-degree VR, you know how insanely ridiculous that could be. It's like, what's drawing your eye? You don't know, right? You don't know what to look at, but the frame on a photograph or the frame on a movie uh, uh, still or even a movie frame uh, on a screen gives you the idea of what you should be looking at and skilled storytellers can use them. I mean, if, if you see suddenly there's a blank space behind me here, as I lean over here, you might think something's about to appear over here, right? Or if you see me getting in a close up, you know that I'm being more serious. These are techniques that we've learned to give things context in different medium and media. And we're learning about how to do that in games these days too. And gaming is a fairly relatively young field. So a lot of this we're borrowing a lot of our, our terminology and our means of conveying context to people from older things, whether they're film or, or photographs or novels or comic books or whatever. We're learning how to uh, convey that to people in different ways. And as we go, as games develop into different things, as we develop virtual reality and other things, we're going to have to develop our own vocabulary for these things. I mean, nobody knew what the hell a tight shot was or a close-up was, for instance, until we started doing film and, and, uh, and photographs. But nowadays, it's part of the vernacular. I mean, it, it gets into, into writing. People write stories and they say, pull in for a tight close-up. And you're like, okay, I know what that is because I've seen it. And it feeds back into itself. But the point is, that, uh, you know, I, I think that Stories and context especially give you a reason to keep playing these games and keep exploring them well beyond any time that you would actually care to play around with that same mechanic over and over and over again. And uh, the reason is because there's so many different variations on story. I mean, it, it, story is about execution. As we know, uh, William Shakespeare stole just about every one of his plots, right? They weren't something that was new to him. Uh, people who were in the time even knew those plots from other plays and stories they'd read and been told them over the years. But it's the execution. It's how you do it. It's how you pull it off. It's the context that you put things in to properly get people emotionally involved in something and engaged in something. And that's what gets them excited about it, about figuring out what, how is this going to end? We have all sorts of different techniques for raising suspense that aren't just, are you going to be able to get that final shot? I mean, it's a great thing if you're watching a basketball game to see somebody do a three-point shot at the buzzer that wins the game, right? But it's even better if you know it's for the championship and they've already gone through two overtimes and this is a rivalry that's been going on for a decade and you know that the, the, uh, the players are just, just, this is it. This is their last chance to possibly do this. If you have that kind of a context around it, it gives that kind of meaning that the mechanics of the game itself won't pull off for you, right? So it's very important, I think, in video games, and I think we don't talk about this kind of stuff enough. It's, it shouldn't just be, you know, nowadays, for instance, I do a lot of work in, uh, in, in open world video games. And a lot of the times, you don't want to just feel like you're just running off and doing mission, like collect three rats over here, 
or you know kill five people over here or you know hit you know touch all the bases as you go around that doesn't mean anything to you after a while if you've done that four or five times you're like okay just another escort mission who the hell cares right but if you're escorting the queen of england on a on a vital uh, mission through Victorian England, and it, it becomes a, a much more important thing. If this is the fate of the empire, rests upon what you're doing, and you know these people that you're working with, and you care about the people if they die, then that's something that you, you're you going to tell your own stories about when you're done, right? You're going to tell your friends and your family. And you're going to be excited about it. You're going to be as geeky about it as you possibly can, because it's gotten into your heart. It's gotten into your brain. It's gotten into your soul. And games don't do that really without stories. Until that point, they're just a fun toy right? There's not enough of an emotional investment in them. But once you get the right context, which is done through story, if you want to call it a story as a narrative, or if you want to tell it through environmental ways, or however you want to do it, uh, that becomes important to you. A game I've become addicted to over the last few years has been something called Marvel Puzzle Quest, right? And I played Bejeweled, and I played, you know, the original Puzzle Quest and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of those are a lot of fun, but just again, the idea that I could play with characters that I care about, because I, I wrote the Marvel Encyclopedia and I've read lots and lots and lots of comic books over the years, to be able to look at that and say, uh, now I get to play with you know, Spider-Man and Doctor Doom and, and the Green Goblin and Captain America, characters that I care about, give it a little bit more of a meaning. And the powers that they manage to, to activate in the game are important because I know what a web slinger is and I know what a shield thrower is and I know uh, what the Silver Surfer rides on and all that. Um, that means something to me. And the neat thing about this is it becomes transmedia at that point. Right? You're not so much concerned about just what's in the video game, but uh, you know, the video game gets to draw on context that you know from other media that you've loved. And that's one of the reasons those franchises become so powerful for people. It's not just that people like to have comfort food, which is often the excuse that you get when they say, okay, they're going to do another sequel. It's going to be Jaws 34 or Star Wars 85 or whatever. It's not that. It's because you care about those characters already. And the reason you care about them is because you know their stories, right? You know their stories. You know who they are. You know what matters to them. And because of that, it matters to you as well. And that's something we can swipe from other media sometimes and put into games. And then those other media can actually take it from games. I mean, nobody went and saw the Assassin's Creed movie without knowing about playing Assassin's Creed, right? They, they didn't go to see it just to see Michael Fassbender run around pre being an assassin. They did it because they were fans of the game and they were intrigued by this. And he went off and did that. I mean, in video games nowadays, often we have one of the largest audiences in the world, right? We have more people playing video games than are going out to see films in a lot of cases or watching television. And we have bigger budget releases than they do for film and television nowadays. And I think we need to take that seriously and realize that as a field, these are the kind of things that we should be interested in, the kind of things we should be exploiting and exploring, right? And not just say, oh, uh, Ian Bogos, for instance, had an uh, article recently where he said, you know, uh, there's no reason to tell these stories in video games because, you know, what's the point? You can tell it better in another field. That's ridiculous. I mean, it, it, the games, we're trying to make the best games we can. We use every tool available. We don't say, well, that's not gamey enough. We bring in everything we humanly can, best artwork, the best uh, writing, the best gameplay, the best uh, mechanics, everything else, because we want to make fantastic games, not because we want to set aside tools that might be useful. And again, we want to have people care about this. This is art at a certain level. Sure, it's commerce, right? We all want to pay our bills, and we want to be able to make more of these games, which we can't do unless we can pay our bills but we want to make sure that we're, we're getting people involved in them on an emotional level as well. Um, so one thing I want you guys to do as an activity about this kind of thing, for instance, is to think about how you would take a game of whatever kind, take a mechanic of some kind, and change the context of it to make it entirely something new. And that's not just a mashup I'm talking about, but to take something that's overused and tired and done to death, for instance, and, uh, and make something new of it, for instance, Tic-tac-toe is a game that everybody's learned how to play. And once you've learned how to play, you know there's no way to beat it, right? There's, it's kind of pointless to play because every, the cat will get the game every time if you know what's going on. You can bring it to a draw. But come up with a, uh, a setting that makes people care about that. Why is a stalemate important? Why is it always important to drive something to a stalemate? And maybe losing occasionally is worthwhile. Maybe the context will give you a reason for that. Maybe you're building a league up around it. Maybe there's a series of games you need to do. Whatever's going to work for you, right? Uh, you know, take a game like Overwatch and say, okay, what would what would change about Overwatch if we were to bring this into the My Little Pony universe, for instance, right? Come up with something different. You know, uh, try to make it something exciting and new. And you know, this is not something where I'm telling you to go build a game. Just use this as a thought experiment and try to figure out about how uh, things change once you change their context. 
why did things care? Why, why did that change how you feel about it? Why does it change who would care about it too, right? I mean, my daughter's going to care about my little pony a lot more than I am, right? But that doesn't mean it's, it's useless. It means it's a great way to reach out to her and her cohort as opposed to me and mine. I'm getting old, right? It's not going to be me around there. We have to look out for new people doing new different things and figure out how we can get excited about that and get them excited about that. So, you know, do the best you can with this kind of stuff. Think about how the context informs what you're working with and why you're working with this stuff and gives meaning. And the neat thing about that is it's going to draw more and more people to this art that you're creating and give you a broader audience and get people more engaged in what you're doing. And in the end, at the end of the day, that's really what we're doing this kind of stuff for. I mean, if we wanted to be making money, we'd all be bankers, right? We'd all be, have sticky finger bankers out there. What we're really trying to do is entertain people and tell them about the world and how it works around them and express some meaning in what we're doing. And if you can do that by building the proper context, then I think you're going to have something that you're doing that's meaningful with your time as well.